Okay, good. So, so I've started the meeting. Uh, you just click on your link. It will allow, ask me, uh... okay. So we are really glad and actually honored to have Professor Robin Brown as our invited guest today. Professor Brown is adjunct professor at the Department of Pediatric Surgery at the Red Cross Children's War Memorial Hospital and University of Cape Town. Um, he did his MBCHB at the UCT, then diploma in child health, uh, did his FRCS from Edinburgh, then fellowship of College of Surgeons uh, in South Africa. And he was conferred honorary fellowship of the College of Pediatric Surgeons in 2017 for his contribution to the field of pediatric surgery. Something interesting to note is that in addition to his medical and pediatric surgical degrees, he also has MPhil in ancient cultures from the University of Stellenbosch. And is quite an authority on, on the history of Egypt, etc. So something nice to talk about when we meet him socially. Um, he underwent his surgical training at Krutuskir, pediatric surgery training at Red Cross and Hospital for Sick Children in London. And his special interests are antenatal diagnosis, gastrointestinal diseases, uh, endoscopy. And he has got uh, about 60 articles and 11 chapters in the test book. So Rob, we're really honored to have you as our guest today. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I will invite Dr. Pedersen to share her screen and start talking. Kirsty, I'm recording the meeting. Thank you. Okay. Good evening and welcome. I'll be talking about inflammatory bowel disease today, as mentioned. So we'll look at inflammatory bowel disease, which consists of ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, and indeterminate colitis. Um, many patients can present with the combination of features from the above disease. These ones are the ones that are termed indeterminate. Um, and this suggests that inflammatory bowel disease is more of a spectrum rather than individual conditions. In the presentation, I'll briefly cover each condition and then look at how we make a diagnosis the medical management, and then the surgical management for each condition. Ulcerative colitis is a mucosal-based inflammatory disease, which is limited to the colon. It primarily involves the rectum and then spreads in a continuous fashion to the rest of the colon. It is a chronic colitis with periods of remission between recurring exacerbations. It is commonly diagnosed after 20 years of age, but 20% of patients can present before that. There's an increased frequency seen in Western and Jewish communities throughout the world. The exact cause of these diseases is unknown, but a multifactorial etiology has been suggested. This includes factors such as infections, genetic, immunological, and psychological. It carries with it a risk for colorectal carcinoma and can be cured by surgical management. Ulcerative colitis presents with intestinal and extraintestinal signs and symptoms. Intestinal is persistent diarrhea, which can contain blood, mucus, or pus, abdominal cramps, and loss of appetite. Extraintestinal can be loss of weight, fatigue, arthralgia, pyoderma gangrenosum, which is the top right picture, and then erythema nodosum, which is the bottom right picture. 15% of these patients will initially present with fulminant disease, especially in the pediatric population. This is profuse bloody diarrhea with severe low abdominal pain, fever, and sepsis. Then looking at Crohn's disease, it's inflammation of the entire gastrointestinal tract from the mouth to the anus. Uh, Crohn's disease has transmural inflammation with granuloma formation. These can then develop into fissures and ulcers, which are interspersed with normal mucosa. There's an increased frequency of this disease in Caucasian, Western, and Jewish populations throughout the world. It also has a multifactorial etiology with environmental factors, intestinal biome, and genetic causes. It is a lifelong disease. Surgery is not curative. It has a chronic relapsing course. 
Crohn's disease can also present with intestinal and extra-intestinal signs and symptoms. So intestinal is non-specific low abdominal pain or mass in the right lower quadrant. Perirectal disease, which can be non-healing fissures, abscess, or skin tags. And then fistula formation, which can be interacutaneous to the bladder, vagina, or psoas muscle. And then you present with the signs and symptoms from complications of those fistula. Then other signs of inflammatory bowel disease for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can be anemia, primary sclerosing cholangitis with liver impairment, kidney stones, osteoporosis, growth retardation, and delayed sexual maturity. Extra-intestinal for Crohn's disease also then includes the loss of weight fatigue. Um, many patients primarily present with ulceralgia and then the skin changes. So indeterminate colitis is about 10% of patients at presentation. They have inflammatory bowel disease, which does not clearly fit the description of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. Um, in our population, intestinal TB as well as CMV colitis can also confuse the diagnosis. Most of these patients will develop into Crohn's disease, thus they experience a high risk of complications and morbidity after colectomy and pouch formation. So it's advised to rather in these patients do a stage surgery with resection and stoma formation and then delay the pouch formation and anal reconstruction for six months to a year. I'll go into the details of the surgery later. So looking at making a diagnosis, physical examination for extra-intestinal signs is important to help differentiate between the conditions. Stool MCNS can be sent off to exclude an infectious cause. Um, fecal calprotectin is a protein that is found in the cytosol of the neutrophils. There are increased levels in the stool, uh, which will indicate the migration of the neutrophils to the intestinal mucosa during inflammation of the bowel. This can also be used for monitoring disease response to treatment. On serology, um, the P anchor is largely positive in ulcerative colitis, and ASCA is largely positive in Crohn's disease. Other blood abnormalities can be anemia, a low albumin, and raised CRP and ESR. And then you can do a contrast meal or enema, especially if you suspect Crohn's disease. Um, CT or MRI is the gold standard. So you'll have a lead pipe appearance of the colon on, um, for ulcerative colitis. Um, you can see the contrast meal on the right there showing that lead pipe appearance. So it's a loss of the horse strip and a thickened wall. And then MR enterography can also be done, which will show aperistaltic segments of bowel in Crohn's disease. Endoscopy can be done for Crohn's disease um, if there's involvement of the esophagus or the stomach or the duodenum. And then colonoscopy can be done for diagnosis or to monitor therapy response and for surveillance after surgery. Biopsy findings can be non -specific sorry, can be nonspecific. Um, so the diagnosis is often made on appearance on the scopes. Um, however, about 30% of specimens may show non kz 18 granulomas, which will aid in the diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Then we can perform laparoscopy. This can either be performed for other indications and then um, an incidental finding of inflammatory bowel disease or if inflammatory bowel disease is suspected. In ulcerative colitis, there's the loss of the horstra on the colon with a thickened wall. And in Crohn's disease, you can see fat stranding. Lastly, just to mention under making a diagnosis as well as then to classify each disease, there's a pediatric activity index for each disease. This can then help to classify it into mild, moderate, or severe. And these activity indexes also help to monitor response to treatment. So just looking further to differentiate between the two conditions, ulcerative colitis affects the mucosa in a continuous fashion, whereas Crohn's disease is then transmural with skip lesions, as well as granuloma formation. Ulcerative colitis primarily presents with bloody diarrhea, whereas Crohn's disease primarily presents with weight loss. Ulcerative colitis involves the rectum first and often most severely without any perirectal signs. Um, Crohn's disease may have a normal rectum and then will have the signs of perirectal involvement. 
and ulcerative colitis surgery is curative, and Crohn's disease surgery is not curative, so it is indicated to manage complications from the disease. These patients may need multiple surgeries, so the goal there is to maintain bowel length as they are at risk of developing short bowel syndrome. So just some pictures for Crohn's disease. You can see the fistula formation. The cobblestone appearance is due to the long deep ulcerations that they develop with normal mucosa in between. They can have aphthous ulcers. In ulcerative colitis at the top, you can see mild, moderate, and severe ulceration with the exudative fibrin deposits. They also form pseudopolyps, which is a dematous mucosa between the areas of ulceration. Looking at medical management, the aim of medical management is to achieve remission of active disease, to promote growth through adequate nutrition and suppression of inflammation, and to decrease the need for surgical intervention. The medical management for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is very similar, so I'm going to handle both in one. So it's important in these patients before starting treatment to take a history of medications that they may have already tried, as it's often a chronic course, um, as well as any herbal medications that might have been tried, and as well as dietary changes. In an exacerbation, the child is treated with bowel rest, with IV fluids for resuscitation as well as nutrition and IV antibiotics and steroids. Once you've got them through the exacerbation, um, maintenance therapy is started in a stepwise fashion depending on the severity. So you start with anti-inflammatories such as 5-ASA and then immunosuppressives such as glucocorticosteroids and then calcineurin inhibitors or anti-TNF biologics. And lastly, there's a role for prophylactic metronidazole, which is used widely, but is thus unproven as far as I could see. And then just to highlight the importance of a multidisciplinary team in these patients, um, that will include the pediatrician, pediatric surgeon, dietitian, stoma sister, social worker, psychologist, and support groups. These conditions carry a significant psychological and social impact on the patient, and stress can also often be a precipitating factor in relapsing disease. So for Crohn's disease, they may not need surgery um, initially, but it's important that the surgeon is involved in the multidisciplinary team to start fostering a good relationship with the parent and the child. And then to just be aware of the impact with these children when they transition into adulthood. So as they get older to hand over more autonomy, especially in Crohn's disease, when they decide about surgical intervention. And then also to have a nice thorough um, handing over to adult surgery when the time comes. Looking at the surgical management for ulcerative colitis, the aim is to have the patient free of disease with the best possible function. So we aim to restore normal anatomy as well as function. The timing of surgery is very important as surgery is curative in these patients. This is especially important when we have our pediatric patients. So 80% of patients will be refractory to medical management and will require surgical intervention. 50% of children require surgery before they reach the age of 18. Surgery should not be delayed until the child is malnourished with gross restriction, et cetera. So longer the duration of the disease also carries a greater risk for carcinoma, even if the disease is in remission. So it's important the trend is now to cut sooner rather than later. Indications for surgery is failure of medical management, rescue therapy for toxic megacolon, or if there's been bowel perforation or hemorrhage. In the emergency setting, you can perform a total abdominal colectomy with end alias. In the elective setting, preoperatively, you want to address the child's nutrition, um, adjust the medical therapy, so decrease the immunosuppressive therapy and look at stress dose regimes for steroids. Um, bowel preparation can be done, but it often causes fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, um, so it's not recommended. They can be given IV antibiotics pre-op, and then important to look at DVT prophylaxis as these children are at an increased risk due to their chronic inflammatory condition. And we do a proctocolectomy with ileoanal pull-through and pouch formation is the most commonly done operation for these patients. The different options are laparoscopic versus open, 
during a mucosectomy versus a stapled ileorectal anastomosis, creating a pouch do versus doing a straight pull through, and then doing a stoma versus a single stage operation. That's just to show some images. So it's the removal of the whole colon, um, the different options of pouch formation that's available, the J pouch being the most commonly done, um, and then the end result. Postoperatively, the child is treated with bowel rest and then a contrast study done about six to eight weeks post-surgery to assess the pouch. This can then be followed by stoma closure if the pouch is patent. These patients have a good outcome post-surgery. Short-term, the expected stool frequency can be five to eight stools until the pouch starts functioning well. Um, this should improve around six months to a year post-surgery to roughly four stools per day. Um, the stool frequency can be managed by loperamide or atropine, increasing the fiber intake, avoiding caffeine and spicy foods, as well as probiotics. So it's important to counsel the parents and the patient on this, that it won't be an immediate fix. Um, it can take up to a year for the stool frequency to decrease. Long-term complications, sorry, short-term complication would be wound infection. Long-term, they can have bile obstruction, ileal anal stricture, pouchitis or pouch failure. And surveillance is done yearly via scope and biopsy of the pouch to look for malignancy. Pouchitis, just some short notes on it. Um, it's experienced by 50% of patients post-surgery to varying degrees. They get inflammation of the pouch that's formed. They present with lower abdominal pain with an increased frequency of watery, painful, foul-smelling stools and with fever. You can use the Heidelberg Pouchitis Activity Score. This can help to evaluate the patient and then also track the management and response to treatment of these patients. So again, they're primarily managed in a stepwise fashion with metronidazole um, and then the addition of ciprofloxacin. You can have daily washouts of the pouch and then lastly, steroids can be added. Early recurrence of pouchitis after stopping antibiotics is an indication for continued antibiotics prophylactivity. Um, starting probiotics are shown to reduce the recurrence of pouchitis. And then if the patient has severe symptoms or recurrent pouchitis, this is termed as pouch failure. A contrast study, CT, MRI, or endoscopy can be performed to evaluate for an anatomical cause. Um, and a biopsy may re then reveal evidence of Crohn's disease in the pouch. This occurs in about 30% of patients. Other causes for failure can be intractable stricture, leak, and frequent stooling, which results in a poor quality of life. Um, this pouch failure is then managed with an end ileostomy. Looking at the surgical management for Crohn's disease, the aim in Crohn's disease is to manage complications of the disease while maintaining bowel length. Um, I particularly like this little quote from the one textbook. It says, as surgeons, we should approach the current surgical problem with the patient optimistically and embrace it as an opportunity to afford the patient a symptom-free time rather than sort of getting despondent at the, chronic cause of, at the chronic cause of the disease. Indications for surgery is if there's failure of medical treatment to achieve remission or being unable to wean a patient off steroids, perforation, stricture, fistula formation, if there's bowel obstruction that doesn't respond to medical management and bleeding and then malignancy. Post-surgery, the complications are wound infection and bowel obstruction. Again, in these patients, surgery is not curative. The disease process is often ongoing despite resection. Therefore, there will be recurrence of symptoms, which is again important to counsel patients and parents on. Um, and up to one year post-surgery, 50% of patients experience recurrence. So if there's a small area of disease that requires resection, you can do it open or laparoscopically. Most commonly done is a laparoscopic ileocachectomy with anastomosis, which can either be end-to-end -end or stapled. It's important to resect only the bowel that is grossly involved. There's no benefit in maintaining clear margins. The biggest aim in these patients is to preserve bowel length. 
Um, other options is to then resect with a the primary anastomosis or resect and form a diverting stoma. If there's extensive colonic disease, you can perform a colectomy, mental colectomy with anastomosis, um, followed by aggressive post-surgery medical treatment. The patient has pancolitis with or without rectal disease. You can perform a subtotal colectomy and ileostomy, or colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis, or a proctocolectomy with ileal reconstruction with the ileal J pouch, similar to ulcerative colitis. However, these patients have a very high risk of complications as the disease also involves a small bowel and thus will affect the pouch that is formed. Again, resection is not curative. Looking at stricture management, if the stricture is up to 10 centimeters in length, it can be met, uh, managed by a simple resection and anastomosis or a Hanukkah Mikolish stricture plasty. The strictures 25 to 30 centimeters can be treated with a section or a finny stricture plasty. And lastly, if there's a long, long segment of bowel that is stenosed, you can do a Michelassi technique. Again, the aim here is to um, maintain length of bowel. Lastly, you can also treat a stricture with an endoscopic balloon dilatation. Continuing the surgical management of Crohn's disease, we're getting near the end. Um, if they have bowel obstruction, it's primarily treated with medical management. Um, and only once this has failed and there's a risk to the child's nutrition that you then switch over to surgical. If there's severe perianal disease, you can do a prostectomy, a rectosigmoid resection, or a proctocolectomy with ileostomy. A fistula can be managed with a fistulectomy with or without a diverting stoma, or a setin as seen in the right-hand picture. And then abscesses should be managed primarily with image-guided drainage and antibiotics. And only if that fails, then to do resection. Coming home to Africa, in South Africa, Crohn's disease incidence is around 0 0.3 to 2.6 per 100,000 per year. Ulcerative colitis is about 0 0.6 to 5 per 100,000 per year. The lowest incidence was noted in the colored populations and then the highest in the white populations. Um, since 2000, data from the South African Inflammatory Bowel Disease Registry has shown an exponential increase in these cases of inflammatory bowel disease. This increased prevalence has also been noted, especially in the Black and Cape Colour communities, with low prevalence in the Indian communities. A case study out of Nigeria um, was done on five patients over a seven-year period, ages 7 to 13, and they just had some interesting notes in the case. So three of the patients presented with persistent bloody diarrhea, one presented with uh, received a laparotomy as a suspected appendicitis, and then one was treated for bowel obstruction with laparotomy. So they advanced some reasons for the rarity of inflammatory bowel disease seen in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some of these causes could be the poor health-seeking behavior that these patients often present very late um, and present with complications from the disease rather than initially. And again, the impact of the resource-limited facilities, which then hinder the diagnostic capability, um, being able to diagnose this disease. Two other comments I found interesting out of the article was the rising incidence of inflammatory bowel disease, which is seen in all age groups all over the world, has been associated with the westernized dietary habits and lifestyle that many people now follow. And the article highlighted the interaction between the immunosuppressive therapy used to treat the disease as well as TB, which is also high in South Africa. So both the interaction between reactivating a latent TB in patients and then the increased risk that patients on immunosuppressive therapy have of developing TB. So in conclusion, um, ulcerative colitis mostly affects the mucosa in a continuous fashion, whereas Crohn's disease is transmural with skip lesions and granulomas. Ulcerative colitis primarily presents with bloody diarrhea, whereas Crohn's disease often presents with weight loss initially. Ulcerative colitis will involve the rectum first and most severely, and then con continuing to the rest of the colon. 
um, without perirectal involvement. Crohn's disease can have a normal rectum, um, and then we'll have the signs of perirectal involvement. In ulcerative colitis, surgery is curative and should not be delayed. And in Crohn's disease, surgery is not curative, so medical management should take priority. Surgery is only then indicated to manage complications from the disease. They will need multiple surgeries throughout their lifetime. So the goal is to maintain bowel length in these patients as they risk for developing short bowel syndrome. Indeterminate colitis will most commonly develop into Crohn's disease. Thus, the formation of a pouch and anal reconstruction should be delayed in these patients. And lastly, again, just to highlight that multidisciplinarity, that we only form one small little section out of these patients' lives. found these two great resources that I just wanted to mention, um, both the Circa and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease for Africa. Both websites have really great um, articles, especially aimed at children and explaining what it's like going to school with, um, with inflammatory bowel disease and how you can go prepare for a sleepover and fun things like that. Um, and then Circa also has a pen pal um, set up where children with inflammatory bowel disease can get in contact by email or WhatsApp with other children with the same type of disease. And I think that's such a great thing to be able to offer our patients just some extra support. These were my references. Thank you, Kirsty. That was an absolutely excellent talk. Uh, it's, it's quite an uh, uncommon problem for us. Um, I, it's, it's, uh, you have really summarized it very well. You had, I must congratulate you and Dr. Machaya who has mentored you. So really wonderful presentation. So Kirsty, thank you. Uh, if you can stop sharing, then I'll invite Prof. Brown to share his screen and then give his advice and give his talk. Rob, you can start sharing your screen now and you can start talking as soon as you're ready. Can you see that, Mur? Yeah, perfect. You can see, can you see that? You can hear you also nicely. Yeah, you can go Good ahead. Good evening, everyone. Nice to speak you from Cape Town. I've got very fond memories of East London, particularly for Colin Lazarus. I had the misfortune when I was a medical student to be my superintendent in Tabanshu. And I think he was horrified. 15 years later, he came down to Cape Town and I was the consultant, he was my senior registrar. And I think that gave him enough to run off to East London. It's done a fantastic job. Thanks for asking me to talk about inflammatory bowel disease. I work at Red Cross with a GRT clinic and we are definitely seeing more and more of it. And I just want to highlight some of the problems that I believe are part of IBD, which Kirsty has very elaborately explained to us. First thing as mentioned that there's definitely an increase in IBD in childhood. Caroline Doig in Manchester had a three times increase in the series of children that she was looking at. Seems that Crohn's is more prevalent than you see with the new numbers. In children, it has a disproportionate morbidity. There's a relapsing clinical course, and it seems that we are trying to avoid surgery as much as possible. Often not possible, but it would be nice to avoid it if we can. Just to show the gradual increase of IVD cases over the last 40 years, showing a steady increase. They told us Anne Griffiths was out from Toronto with us in Cape Town recently. She says they see 15 new cases per month of IVD in children. This is looking at the overall figures and you can see less than 17 years, 9% Crohn's and 6% uh, UC and even less children, less than 10. So it's about 10%, less than 10% of the adult figures. The children are different to adults, as we know in many things, but here there's extensive anatomic involvement. It's a changeable disease within two years of diagnosis. And that's why I was always going to be careful doing pouches and things and finding out later that in fact they had Crohn's and not UC. Colonic mm -hmm. predominant phenotype with age dependent involvement of the ileum. So often the colon is involved in the ileum term presents later. Unfortunately, there's rapid progression to complications in Crohn's disease and also in UC. And that's the problem that we're seeing disease that progresses rapidly, unlike adults, where it can be steadied over with medicines. 
This is usually a slide looking at the time from diagnosis, the percent of patients without surgery. And the lower line shows that the children come to surgery long before the adults do. And that's because it's more extensive disease and it's more inflamed. The big problem with children, the delay in diagnosis, often average about three years. And that's because often the rectum is spared, the intestines are involved above it. It may just involve the small bowel, which is a notoriously difficult part of the intestine to have access to, and have unfortunately very non-specific symptoms. Here's some of the red flags. There's an article looking at some of the red flags for IBD. I'm not going to go through them, but a lot of those loose stools, weight loss, frequent ulcers, negative stool MCNS, low albumin, a lot of them are having overlap in many other conditions, and that's what makes it such a problem. But you can see three quarters of children with IBD present with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and weight loss. And those are very non-specific signs and symptoms. And if you don't be wary of IBD, if they're going to pass you by, you think of all sorts of other causes. Rectal bleeding is a nice manifestation. Unfortunately, it's much more common in UC than Crohn's disease. If we're lucky, then with extra intestinal manifestations, about 8%. Growth failure is a big problem in children but obviously I don't really have an adult. You see perianal disease in children, that's one of the first easy signs to pick up. I'll show you a picture of a, an anus that really screams IBD at you and, and that really could help with the diagnosis. And of course, unexplained anemia would be another problem. If you saw an anus like that in a child, I think your first thought has to be IBD. Trauma, obviously, potentially, but IBD, that's not a normal anus. And my first really worrying thought has this child got Crohn's disease? Big thing in children is that they have growth failure. You can see they have terrible anorexia, abdominal pain, they have enteric losses, the hypercatabolism, the surgery resects the bowel, and they have protein loss. So there's significant growth failure, which again becomes a medical problem. That's why it's so important. As we mentioned, you have to have it looked after the medical team as a surgical consult. They get decreased linear growth and growth velocity, particularly in Crohn's disease, although it is sometimes in ulcerative colitis, but certainly much more in Crohn's disease. So how do you investigate them? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the tests may be non-contributory, blood, stool, and serological assay we've mentioned, ultrasound, you may see wall thickening. A berry meal and follow-through was the gold standard, but unfortunately, about two-thirds agree and one third showed features that are not seen on the MRI. So the MRI will pick up one third more features than a barrier, particularly the extent of the perianal disease and the extent of it. And there's a very nice MRI of an abdomen showing clearly the thickened bowel in the right iliac fossa, thickened wall, and that is almost diagnostic of Crohn's disease, clearly where you do a biopsy make sure it's not TB or Yersinia, but that is a very good diagnosis without a major radiation and inv uh, invasive investigation. You can see the sensitive and specificity much higher on MRI, and clearly that should be the investigation of choice to confirm inflammatory bowel disease. Another problem is histological quandary. We find often these children early on are nonspecific IBD, which Kirsty mentioned. Is it infective? Is it nonspecific colitis? And again, these children, one has to treat them conservatively, not be aggressive with your surgery until you can confirm the diagnosis on repeat investigation. So there's a child with typical lymphoid follicles. Another picture of the scope and histology report, you can't read, but it says nonspecific lymphoid hyperplasia. So this child had symptoms and signs suspic suspicious of inflammatory bowel disease, which is a child conservatively antibiotics, and we scoped the child for three months by which time there were more convincing histological changes of Crohn's disease. So how are we going to treat Crohn's disease in children? Well, if it's Crohn's, we're going to try and treat it nutritionally. We're going to use modulin, which is a special uh, food that they have for six weeks, solely taking it, and you can get up to 70% remission with nutritional treatment for Crohn's disease in children. This is a fantastic thing, and it's interesting on adults, don't take it because I don't think they want to be told what to eat for six weeks to taste terrible. They're now trying to increase, a, improve a diet, hyperallergenic diet, 
for Crohn's disease, not just modulin, and they've got a 50% success rate. So clearly, it would be very nice to try and treat Crohn's disease without having to come to surgery. But the aim, if we treat him, is to try and get rid of the disease and present subsequent recovery. Interesting article here looking at the conventional serum markers in pediatric inflammatory bowel disease showing how difficult it may be to make the diagnosis. They had 526 newly diagnosed as IBD cases. And in 21% of mild Crohn's and 54% of mild UC, those four values were all normal. So you can see you might think that everything is normal. You have to have the histology to confirm that it is normal. These tests are not diagnostic. Also important to remember that for Crohn's, you should do a gastroscopy. So any of these children with suspected IVD, you must do a gastroscopy. You see abnormalities in 13%. If you've got gastroscopy changes and gastroscopy gastroid biopsies, then that child must have Crohn's disease, obviously because osteoclasts will not involve this stuff. So that is very important. And we say now, if you're worried about IVD, you must do a gastroscopy at the same time as you do a colonoscopy. Clearly, there's an important difference to distinguish from distribution of disease, the extraintestinal disease. We mentioned the serological markers, MRI, and find the capsule the balloon enteroscopy. Just to highlight some of the medical conditions, ulcerative colitis can have hemorrhage, toxic megacolon, pseudopolyps, even erythema nodosum, pyoderma gangrenosum. Erythema nodosum can also occur in Crohn's disease. Sclerosing cholangitis typically is found with ulcerative colitis. You've got arthralgia and nephrolithiasis and uveitis. So these are some of the associated problems and operating, treating the collective with the collective may not necessarily cure these associated conditions. So as a surgeon, why do we want to operate well? We want to get rid of the dissected diseased bowel. We're going to repair a stricture or a perforation. We might bypass the involved bowel, drain an abscess, and we may have to have, give access for enteral and parenteral nutrition. So we have quite a large role to play as part of the management. But I think one has to emphasize most of the management is done by the gastroenterologist. We're fortunate enough in Cape Town to have David Epstein, who's done a DCH, interested in children. He has extensive experience with adults, which he translates into children, and he still maintains children are much more difficult than adults, different, more aggressive disease wider spread. What do we do for it surgically? Well, we want to remove the grossly involved bowel. We want to try and avoid any anastomonic leak, and these are particularly found in children who've had previous surgery who are malnourished on chronic high-dose steroids. So in that group, you're going to be wary they're going to develop a problem with the leak. Any doubt, you're going to do a deep functioning ileostomy if you're worried about the anastomosis and join that up later. And you can, if possible, if you can conserve the bowel, you're going to need a stricturoplasty to try and keep maintain as long as bowel as possible. So how are we going to do it? We're going to do a local restriction of stricturoplasty because we know there's going to be a recurrence, particularly with multiple anastomoses, if there's disease at the anastomosis, but there's going to be a recurrence 100%. One third will be almost straight away, one third five to 10 years, one third more than 10 years. So I think as surgeons, we must accept take out as little as possible because they're going to come back for another operation and unfortunately you are going to probably have to take out more. We've shown these before. You try and do bypasses to try and conserve as much as possible. Michelic stricturoplasty. Try and conserve as much bowel as possible. Perianal disease, very problematic. And usually the only good thing about it is often painless. It looks terrible, but it is painless. If you normally have a perianal fistula, it is very sore. If you've got Crohn's disease and your fistula, it looks terrible. It's often not as painful as it gets. The only advantage, difficult to treat, antibiotics, immunosuppressives, you might drain it, put a cetin in, and if it's very severe, you might try and defunction with a stoma as a temporary procedure to try and let the area settle down. Visceral fistula, one of the complications of Crohn's disease, 50 percent recur if you treated them with medical treatment. So you're going to excise the fistula, the local resection of the adjacent viscous. Ulcerative colitis, completely different. Often they come for emergency surgery. Here they've got ongoing 
bleeding that you can't stop, or they've got a toxic megacolon. And those patients, you do a subtotal colectomy with an ileostomy and a mucus fistula, and you come back at a later date for definitive surgery. So the life-saving surgery is removing the colon and doing an ileostomy. If it's not emergency, we're going to remove the infected colon. We're going to either do an ileostomy, do an ileo anal anastomosis with or without a pouch, as was mentioned. The ileo anal is a much simpler operation, low complications. They don't get pouchitis, but they have an increased diarrhea. Pouch formation good for decreasing stool frequency and less incontinence. Any doubt about child osteocolitis rather than in one stage surgery, one should always do three stage surgery, particularly in children. And it was an emergency, they're on high dose steps or malnourished, less than five years old. And I've mentioned before histological query. I had a medical legal case from the Arab Emirates where the child was initially diagnosed as osteocolitis. They did a pouch and found that later the child had Crohn's disease. So we talk about an ileo anal anastomosis or an ileo pouch anal anastomosis. Ileo anal anastomosis is simpler. You have increased stool frequency and incontinence. Ileo pouch anal anastomosis has exceptional early complication rate with a low early stool frequency and better long-term continence. So it would seem to be the better option. That's just a that's showing you simple ileo anal anastomosis on the left and a J pouch on the right. However, all is not gold. If you look at long-term results, 26 patients, 10 to 24 years post-surgery. Look at the complication rate. Long-term complications, 88%. Thyroid rate of surgery, 75%. Reoperation, 50%. So the ileo pouch anastomosis is not without problem. It definitely seems to have better bowel function, quality of life, and cosmesis than historical plants and the ileo anastomosis. If you look at that graph, it's interesting to see that the time passed pull through. If you look at the top, it's a straight pull through, and the bottom is a J pouch. The mean stool frequency starts off at 16 a day, goes down to eight a day. If you've had a pull, straight pull through, it goes down to seven if you've had a J pouch. Still a problem, seven stools a day. Of course, if you've had a straight pull through without the pouch, as you can see right, you do not have pouchitis. So that is eliminated to a certain extent. What's important in these children, they require follow-up, obviously not only from the surgical and medical side, you have to worry about reproductive health counseling. They have problems with infertility, girls, particularly in Crohn's disease. You want to know genetically, they have a high risk of following with Crohn's and osteocolitis. And of course, particularly in osteoarthritis, cancer screening, which requires ongoing colonoscopy. It's interesting to show that you get good growth response to surgery. There's 55% restoration of growth in these children looking at albumin and weight to height. The best time to do the operation, don't wait until the epiphyses are closed and don't wait for puberty. Dress to try the operation before them. Except there will be a high reoperation, 50% by 20 years. I think one has to warn the parents. I don't think one underestimates mental health in children with IBD. Psychosocial difficulty, they get depressed, they can't go to school, they have family conflict, school absence, parental commitment, financial implications. These are all huge problems for these children and they need to be addressed. Doing the operation is one thing, addressing the mental health is going to have a very important role to play. We mentioned IBD and cancer, particularly also colitis, 3% during the first 10 years. Increases 1% per year after 10 years. 10 to 15 minutes per decade subsequent. Even Crohn's has an increase up to 30 years post-diagnosis. And it's said that these children with IBD have a two times increase of cancer overall, all cancers, two times increase. So in conclusion, there's definitely an increasing incidence of IBD. We're going to see it more and more in children. The diagnosis occurs in about 10% of children of patients under 17. It's challenging management. It's extensive degrees. The diagnosis can be late and difficult. We've got to think of exclusive internal nutrition if we can, because that would be a fantastic way to cure them without an operation. Once you've had operations, you know they're going to come back. And long-term treatment has safety issues, particularly obviously monoclonal antibodies and possible long-term development of secondary tumors. 
And at all times in children, we have to think of the importance of growth. We've got to try and keep these children growing. We must not let the disease slow them down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, we really uh, appreciate, I mean, this is what we, we uh, invited you for, such a vast experience, such wisdom. No, thank you, that is, that is absolutely excellent. Um, Rob, uh, you have given your advice. I'll invite now, I see Professor Hadley is, is participating. So I will ask for his opinion, his advice, his experience, Prof Hadley. Uh, thanks, Mohan. Thanks, uh, thanks, Rob. I have to say that um, uh, both Kirsty and Rob, I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm very fortunate. I had an almost entirely African practice, and inflammatory bowel disease was incredibly rare. Whenever we thought we had a patient with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, it either turned out to be tuberculosis or it turned out to be amoebiasis. Now, I know things have changed with the um, HIV pandemic and things like CMV uh, have now crept into the, uh, um, into the picture. But it would interest me to know uh, in the African population, how much of this are we seeing? I know that my colleague, uh, Mr. Shekhafour, has uh, been treating a number of children in the Indian community with, uh, with ulcerative colitis and has done a number of uh, colonic resections and, and J pouches. Um, but it's certainly not common up, uh, up, here, in, uh, up here in KZN. And I, I'd just like to, if I may, take issue with um, uh, Kirsty's concept of cure. Um, I don't think if you simply take one set of problems and you replace them with another set of problems that you've cured the patient, that anything that's got an 88% long-term uh, complication rate is, is, to me, hardly a cure. I'd also like to take um, uh, issue with Professor Chitness, who introduced uh, Professor Brown, saying that he had special interests in, in uh, antenatal diagnosis and uh, uh, endoscopy, uh, without mentioning that, uh, apart from his interest in the life of the pharaohs, that he has a, prov a, a pervading interest in, in wine and, and rock and roll. Um, <laughs> and that, that make him an, it makes him an even more uh, entertaining uh, individual when you meet him non-clinically. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Adley. Yes, uh, Rob, uh, can, do you want to comment about uh, its incidence in African children? Thanks, Millard. Yes, well, I think Larry is dead right. You know, we said at Red Cross we saw maybe two cases a year from the whole of the referral base. We used to get referral cases from East London in the old days. We are now seeing five to 10 cases a year, definitely much more, definitely increasing. So I think that we are going to see more of it. As I said, it seems to be more Crohn's and ulcerative colitis that's, that the increase is in. So, and, and we certainly at Red Cross now are seeing it more. And again, I think what's important to emphasize that we have a follow on clinic with the adult gastroenterologist at the IBD clinic, because clearly these patients have to be transferred onto there for further ongoing management. And I think that's essential. Otherwise they get lost falling between the, the two stools and it's not a good place to be. Yes, thank you. And I, I think what happens Rob is uh, in private, I think you see, tend to see children up to 17, 18 years of age sometimes um, are, are much yes. more likely than in state practice. So I think in state practice, many of these children, adolescents may be going to the adult surgeons and we may not be seeing them. So, so that might be the reason why we miss them. I distinctly remember we had a couple of children with uh, ulcerative colitis who were sort of borderline 12, 13, and then they were referred to Cape Town and had surgery. But I think, uh, Kirsty, it is important for all of us to uh, know uh, that the, the books use these words as curative, etc. But it's quite clear after Prof. Brown's talk that uh, it is actually not a curative. It takes away that major problem in ulcerative colitis, but still you need to keep uh, surveillance, et cetera. So I think this is, this is quite nice uh, for us to understand. I'll invite Dr. Selo Machaya, who is our consultant pediatric surgeon with special interest in GI. 
and who has also uh, helped and advised Dr. Uh, Kirsty to prepare her talk. Hello. Anything else you want to comment, ask questions about? Yes, thanks, Prof. Uh, thanks, Kirsty. Very good uh, presentation. It's a very difficult topic sometimes to understand, and you put it in a very uh, understandable and easy way. Uh, thanks, Prof. Rob, as well, um, for, for your input. We highly appreciate it. But I think <clears throat> what, what, what can be a take-home message as well um, for the juniors and even for myself is the present the slide that Kirsty had about the conclusion where she uh, highlighted the differences between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's because it's not an easy condition to kind of identify. We're missing, I think we're missing quite a lot um, because since I've been in East London, um, we have not really had a a, a, a child um, referred to us with uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. They may have had it at the time. Um, some form of colitis um, might be uh, indeterminate colitis um, from CMV or TB, but not necessarily uh, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. But I think what's important um, out of everything is have a high index of suspicion. Um, in our population, where we are in a middle income society now, we are we've kind of been upgraded from a low income society. Now we're starting to deal with more Western uh, pathology and with Western pathology, it's because of the Western diet, um, we start seeing things like uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And it's important to have a high index of suspicion because um, what usually happens as well, we see a child who's malnourished, who has diarrhea, and obviously what comes to mind is TB, uh, HIV, but we miss um, that we are a developing nation and we are starting to see issues that pertain to developing nations like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so I think sus suspicion, it's, it's very, very good to have it so that you can actually start looking for it. Um, the multidisciplinary uh, management of it, I think it's pivotal. Um, from a surgical point of view, other than causing more cuts to the child, uh, we, we, we're not really helping as much as you think we are, I think. And if, as much as Kirsty said that with ulcerative colitis it's curative, I think what she meant um, was that at least from a surgical point of view, we know where the problem is, let's cut it out. And hopefully we've sorted the issue. The same way we have a child with appendicitis and you take the appendix out, yeah. but later on they come in with adhesive bowel obstructions and problems. So fair enough, um, it might not be curative because definitely there are complications with the proposed cure that we give in the child. But I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile just realizing that at least um, we can do something. As a surgeon, you always feel like um, you wanna actually help the patient and uh, excise the pathology instead of just waiting and seeing and trying all these diets and things, which hence why I'm saying that a multidisciplinary approach is pivotal um, because they can actually advise on the diet. The pediatricians can advise on the corticosteroid, immunomodulators, and um, even the serolo serology, as, as it's stated. Um, nothing is really diagnostic. You can't just say, do this one blood test, and this patient has ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So it's all about um, looking at every single factor um, and making up your mind as to what it is. And still, once we made up our mind and we think it might be ulcerative colitis and later on the patient comes in with another problem, now in the small bowel, then you realize that, oh, it was not actually ulcerative colitis, it was Crohn's. And now you've caused a morbidity to the child, which is lifelong because there'll be further complications from your initial surgery and from the new, if I should say, um, disease of the Crohn's disease. So I think um, good investigations, good multidisciplinary approach and good counseling to the family goes uh, a very long way. Uh, from the surgical side, yeah, we, we, we think we can do everything, but we need to realize that um, surgery does not necessarily always uh, cure problems. It can make them better, definitely, but it might not completely relieve the problem. But yeah, I think that's my five cents. And Kirsty, good job. Thanks. Thank you, Selo. I think that a uh, high index of suspicion, I think uh, we need to inform the pediatricians also uh, because they are likely to see these patients much before we see them. Uh, Kirsty, there is a question from Dr. Gray. 
Western diet refers to which particular food that predisposed to inflammatory bowel disease in children? Do you have any specific information about it, Kirsty? No, I don't have any specifics. I don't know what the article included in Western diet. You can ask Prof. Brown. I, Rob, sorry, Kirsty, go ahead. No, well, I would assume it's sort of the increased fatty foods and the, the rich foods. I'm sure Dr. Prof. Brown would know more. Yeah. Uh, Rob, uh, can you answer that question? About yeah, what I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to remove the allergens. That's the big thing. That's what they're yes. trying to say. Yes. So if you're going to have it, then you must. It must have lack. You must have no animal fat. You must have no dairy, no red meat. You know, they, those are the type of things that are regarded as causing allergens. That's 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 the type of things they're trying to eliminate when they're treating Crohn's disease. Yes. So those simple things that we would now regard as Allergic, allergic food, food allergy. If you've got a small child with food allergy, you try and avoid them. And then you put them back on a diet and you withdraw, reduce them slowly. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Yashoda, Dr. Manik Chand is our consultant. I just wanted to ask if she has any comment, any questions, Yashoda? Uh, yes, thanks, Prof. And thanks to Kirsi and Prof. Brown um, for their valuable input about this topic. I just want to add that, yeah, there's the Western diet. This is why I think, I mean, um, we don't see a lot in our practice, but I have a niece who's been diagnosed with Crohn's. So I feel like it is a Western diet, but also um, maybe an overuse of antibiotics and a disruption in the natural microbiome of uh, the children's intestines. It's just showing us the kind of lifestyle that we are living and we'll say in Western society in inverted commas, um, but we're seeing more um, IBD in children who are moving from a rural setting to mm. an urban setting. Um, so it is an, in, it's a problem that's growing. And I would like to ask Prof Brown, I think he has presented to us on the use of fecal transplant uh, for these children. And if he is using them, uh, using it and to tell us about his experience with that. Yeah, listen, it's a fecal trial not for inflammatory bowel disease. Okay. That's for recurrent C. diff infection. So okay. that, but not, I, I, I wouldn't think of it as a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease. We certainly used it, and I know um, at Vincent Pelosi, Dave Epstein has used it for a few things, and it seems to work well, but I wouldn't, as a treatment for inflammatory bowel disease, I don't think it's, it's been shown to have any effect. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Majola is our other consultant in pediatric surgery. Dr. Majola, is he still around? Um, I saw he was here. Dr. Majola, is he here? He's probably not here. Uh, maybe he had to go. Um, so I think Rob, Final advice from you. Uh, I've yes, I, you know, I, learned a lot. I think, I think I, final conclusion, concluding remarks. Right. I want to say it's a difficult diagnosis in children. You've got to worry about the growth. And I do think you've got to have a high index of suspicion because they may have very few signs and symptoms. And I would say in a child that I'm suspicious of, I would do the test. I would do a calprotectin. Mm -hmm. If that is normal, I would happily see them again in six months and review. I think the calprotectin in Ukraine is, is high. Mm. Normally less than it goes up to 2,000, 3,000. If that is normal, I would say that was a very reassuring. I would not dismiss it. I would say, come back in six months, we'll review if everything else is negative. Mm. I know that that's perfect. Rob, thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Sela, for your advice. Thank you very much, Rob, uh, for- Pleasure, sir. For, for your uh, insight and for your knowledge and wisdom. We really appreciate it. And I hope to see you sometime, somewhere in the country when this nonsense of COVID is over. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thank Take you, care. everybody. Uh, we'll close the meeting. Thanks for your presence. And next week, uh, Dr. Helga Nahaus, our registrar, is going to talk about common research language for a pediatric surgeon or a pediatric surgery trainee. And uh, Professor Samad Sheikh will be the invited guest. So we expect to see you next week, Tuesday evening at five o'clock. Thank you. Excellent meeting. Sharp, we finish at six o'clock. Bye-bye now. <laughs>